You've got McAvaney, Cometti and Roberts. And then you've got these two. Nuffies. Living in denial. It's Croft and Horto. Welcome to the Fat Side Podcast. Righto, well, uh, I'm losing count, Rob, of how many Fat Side episodes we've done so far in isolation, but it's been bloody good fun. And uh, one thing, it's great to talk to the champions, it's great to talk to your Brad Souls of this world who've, who've won a couple of flags, but it's also nice to talk about the ultimate competitors, the blokes that got the most out of themselves and the cult figures of the game. And this bloke was certainly a cult figure for the Carlton Football Club, Dennis Armfield. Welcome to the Fat Side, mate. Thanks, guys. Thanks for having me. Um, great intro. I'll, uh, I'll pay his later, I reckon, for that one. <laughs> Beautiful. Yeah, cash is king for us, certainly down at Podular Media. Trust me. Um, but, mate, it's it's great to have you on. And um, like I said there, mate, you're, you're a player that really did get the best out of himself. And I know from a few of my close Carlton friends, and we'll have to give the Blueprint a bit of a shout-out off the top of podcasts that we work with. And I believe they uh, interviewed you a couple of years back, Dennis. But... Um, is it true to say just off the top before we maybe go back to the start where it all began for you and your footy career, is it true to say that you you basically just gave you your all and you really were the ultimate competitor? Is that how you tried to get the best out of yourself on the footy field? Yeah, look, mate, um, I just didn't want to leave any stone unturned. Um, my old man used to tell me, give everything a red hot crack and go 100% and give it your all. And if you fail, well, at least you know you failed, giving it a crack. And um, footy was similar to that. When the first siren went to when the final siren went, I just I gave it all I had. And sometimes it didn't pay off, mate. And sometimes I made some some cracking errors. And um, But I think, yeah, I just wanted to, to do myself proud firstly, then those that are close to me, and then the, the Carlton, Carlton faithful. Um, and, yeah, I, I gave it everything I had. And... Um, yeah, I don't think I had much more once so I uh, decided to hang up the boost, that's for sure. That's right. Now, 145 games for the Blue Baggers. Um, let's, let's go back um, and let's, let's talk about where it all began for you. Um, Wikipedia, one of the most reliable sources on the internet. Uh, it says that you grew up in Canberra and you played rugby. Is that correct? Yeah, I was born in Canberra. I, didn't, I wouldn't say I grew up there. I was born in Canberra. I lived there till I was six um, and then... Um, through my parents separating. Unfortunately, I um, followed my dad across to Perth and I was sort of raised there in Perth where I played rugby until I was, yeah, 17 years of age. Beautiful. And um, at the moment, what's going on in isolation? I believe you're playing your footy down at Park Orchards and uh, you're playing with a very abnormal uh, person who just happens to be my brother, um, who's, I think he's... He, he always increases his centimetres every time he gets selected for a new club. So pre pre going into a new club, Dennis, he says, oh, I'm, a, I'm 204, I'm 205. And then all of a sudden, a few weeks later, he's at a new football club because he's played for about 25 in his career. And um, he's 208 centimetres. So when he walked into Park Orchards, Orchards how, how tall did he say he was? Yeah, he said he was 210, mate. So he's, <laughs> definitely, had a, he's definitely had a growth spurt. Um, yeah, no, look, down at, um, down at Park Orchards, obviously with uh, Corona and all that, that's um, been slowed down, unfortunately. But it looks like the uh, there's a bit of light at the tunnel, at the end of the tunnel, which is good. But, yeah, enjoy, enjoying playing. I can't give up footy, mate, that much. I, I needed to slow down a little bit, but I couldn't slow down fully. So, yeah, isolation for me is just trying to keep fit as well as I can. And before we started, you know, I spoke about bike riding and going for runs and... and Home gym, which I'm lucky to have. It's not that crash hot, but it, it keeps me ticking the body over, mate. So it keeps me physically and mentally sane, I think. So I need it. Start of your career. Um, we'll go all the way back. 2007, picked up with number 46 in the draft. Uh, talk us through the emotions of getting the phone call, finding out that you've been selected, and then, um, you know, walking in the doors of Carlton. Yeah, well, I was stitched in the first start of my career. Um, I was at a... a pre-season training down the beach with uh, Swan Districts the day of the draft because I didn't think I was going to get picked up. And, um, yeah, long story short, one of the boys' fathers yelled out, oh, congratulations, pick 18 to Geelong. And I was, I was stoked. And, and then he sort of said, nah, just taking the piss. And um, so when Carlton announced pick 46, I didn't believe it. Um, I was like, nah, 
I don't believe you. And, and then I, had, I got back to the car and I had about 10 missed calls from an unknown number. And I still am today. I don't really like answering unknown numbers. So um, didn't bother about ringing it back. And then eventually I answered and it was uh, Greg Swan from Carlton, mate, and um, sort of said, congratulations, pick 46. Um, you're flying out tomorrow to come over and start your preseason. So it was a bit of a, a weird feeling. It was excitement that, wow, I'm, I'm now, you know, beginning a career at Carlton Football Club. But then it was like, hang on a minute, did you just say tomorrow? Um, you know, I'm flying out at nine o'clock on Sunday. Yeah, that, that sounds great. I, I um, you know, see your mates, see your friends, see your family and away I go. So it was a bit of a catch-22, but the, the good thing about it was we had a sort of two-week pre-Christmas training and then we we're going to be back anyway. So I sort of knew that I was there for a short time before I could return back, but absolutely over the moon, mate. But then I also was realistic that the hard work was only about to begin because um, without being rude, but you're at the bottom of the pecking order again, you've got to work your way up and it's a pretty competitive environment um, as a lot of people know. And getting there was one thing, but trying to make it stick was another. And that was all going through my mind in the, the process of 24 hours. Yeah. Uh, first game, round 10, 2008 against the Cats. The reigning premiers, uh, one of the all-time great sides. Sadly, lost by 10 goals. But you yourself had a pretty good game with 23 touches. Uh, Two-part question. Firstly, how was it? And did you match up against any of those superstars and sort of look around and be like, whoa, I'm next to some of these guys? <laughs> it was pretty surreal, mate. Like, I was due to debut two weeks earlier. Um, Rats come up to me and said, if you get through this game, you'll uh, you'll debut against West Coast over at home. And I tore my adductor um, that week. And so that was a bit of a disappointment. Um, but yeah, running out first game, I was to play on Travis Varco. He was my opponent. Um, he was who I was meant to do a role on for Geelong because he was the speedy whippet and he was going to teach me a few things or two. And I remember uh, finishing the game and, you know, just... It was all a bit of a blur, if I'm honest, but I remember walking off and, yeah, 23 touches, first game. This this game's all right. I'm going to be a, I'm going to be all right at this. You know, it's only going to get better from here. And I think I only beat those amount of disposals twice more in my career. So, um, yeah, I, I welcomed it with a bang and it was a bit of a deflated balloon after that. Yeah, that's funny. That was like Alan Tovey, I think, we had on our podcast very early in the piece i think it was our fourth episode and he kicked four goals i believe in the first game of his career and then he only went on to kick an extra two or three for the remaining 170 odd games that he played so a little bit funny isn't it when people just bob up in their debut but um mate i uh i can't remember that game because of course it wasn't a classic uh no offense but i did look at the stats and i thought to myself i hope you weren't playing on stevie johnson because you kicked five that day but you said there you're definitely playing on trav varco i'm never gonna say who i really played on mate so uh <laughs> that's the tricks of the trade we never give up those tricks mate but nah look i um you know, I remember there's some great players, especially for Geelong and, and, and us. You know, I remember getting to the club and Chris Judd came in the same year and, you you know, and Heath Scotland's and these blokes, Carazzo, Simpsons. And, yeah, look, mate, I think um, when you're on the end of a 60-point flogging, I think uh, Geelong had the uh, the upper hand that day and Stevie J was just the recipient of all the good work. Uh, we'll jump forward another year, 2009 finals. Uh, finish seventh, go to play Brisbane at the Gabba. Mm. Up by a few goals, end up going down by seven points. The following year, finish eighth, and you get done by Sydney week one of the finals by five points. Two just, you know, near misses, I guess you could say. Uh, did one of them hurt more than the other, or are they both just as bad? Oh, just both as bad, I think. Um, yeah, Brisbane were up and about. We we're playing some really good football, and the uh, Bradshaw-Brown combination just took charge and um, went bang. And, yeah, we just couldn't stem the flow. And it was pretty gut-wrenching. You know, you sort of sit there and, um, yeah, it's over. And you're in Brisbane. You know, you're a long way from home. And then Sydney, well, yeah, Sydney finals. I, I haven't had the greatest experience against Sydney finals. And, um, again, you know, you get so close but so far. and um, no finals loss is a, is a good loss. Um, but 
great experiences and, you know, it led to some good patches that we had and, you know, years to come and, you know, we got to West Coast and I still think to this day we were robbed, but uh, mm. could have won that one. And then it would have taken us to Geelong who we were pretty competitive against that year. So it would have been interesting. Um, but look, hindsight's a lovely thing, isn't it? It is. Now, I don't want to rub it in too much, but you were four goals up, Dennis, against Brisbane at three-quarter time in that elimination final. What happened, mate? Was the pump up at three-quarter time not good enough? Did it not get the lads going? Because, I don't know, for me personally, when I watch footy, and I've seen Melbourne gas it many a time as a uh, beloved Dees fan, particularly at three-quarter time, even halfway during the fourth quarter, I've seen Melbourne lose games that are almost impossible to lose. What's that feeling like? I know this is a bit of a negative take, but I want to get a bit of an insight into it. When you're playing away, hostile crowd, it's a final, you're up by three, four goals, and then the other team gets a run on and you can't stop it. Is that one of the more deflating parts of footy when you're in that high-pressure environment? It's probably one of the most frustrating things ever because you you train for plans and you're, you're, you think if a team gets some momentum, what can we do to wrestle this back but then you sort of forget that well what are they doing to maintain it and I you know you you look at um Brisbane for instance like the conditions up there are something that's slightly different and as the as the dew kicks in and um that sort of takes over and they were just cleaner and, and much better in those final sort of moments and the crowd was going absolutely ballistic and when you've probably only got you know, we're pretty good as, as a Carlton cheer squad that go and travel. So we, we have a fair few people there, but they're up and about. And yeah, they just had all the answers and, and they were coming and they were playing like a team um, that had nothing to lose, which, you know, they weren't when they were that far down. And if we're honest, mate, we just tightened up and there's no other real excuse to it. Um, things weren't working. Um, players were probably getting beaten in their one-on-ones that they were winning earlier in the game, myself included. and um, yeah, unfortunately, at the end of the day, mate, the siren went and Bradshaw and Brown just took control and thanks a lot. So it wasn't your fault then? Ne- never my fault, mate. My, <laughs> my role. Don't worry about that. I remember that precisely. Definitely. Uh, 2010, this is a better result for you. Uh, finally break the finals. Good back. result for you too, bro. Yeah. Uh, you smashed my boys, Essendon, by 10 goals. We still haven't won a final um, since 2004. But either way, uh, 90,000 <laughs> at the G. Obviously, electric feeling for all Carlton supporters. Must have been pretty special um, into that last quarter, knowing that you had the job done. Yeah, you, you like to think that, but you sort of, it's weird, mate. It's, when you're out there, you sort of don't really probably go into that mindset until you get below the five minute mark. Um, you know, we played teams where, you know, you brought up Brisbane, for instance, but we played games throughout the year where you're up and about and you can catch up, and, and vice versa, you're, you're down by a mile and you can catch up. and Essendon were a good side that year. Um, not as good as us, unfortunately. But, um, yeah, so uh, when you play at the G, mate, against an arch rival um, in a packed finals game, it's always going to be a ripper. And, and when you're up and about and, and you're having a win and, you know, you're going to be around for another another week at least, you know, um, it's always exciting, mate. And, yeah, it was Another really good game, and unfortunately, the week after wasn't so good. But anyway, we won't worry about that one. No, we're going to talk about that one, Dennis. Uh, it'd be remiss of us not to talk about that one. I vividly remember this game. I was over at a, a friend's house in, I don't know, Hawthorne or Kew or something, um, and big, big Carlton fan. Um, there are a few boys there that, that love the baggers, and we're all watching there. I think it was someone's 21st. So it was a big occasion, big night, watching the game. And I'll never forget the final... I think two, three minutes of the game and there's an incident in the goal square and I think it's um, Andrew Walker um, is clearly being held. But you look back on it now um, and I actually, I did look back on it this morning and I was, my, my memory was right, which was, which, which was amazing given how long ago it is. But they're never, in my mind, when I look at it now, I go, I go to myself, they're never going to pay that one in front of the Perth crowd. Um, and I think... You know, that's a Victorian bias thing coming through. But the reality is, if you look at the stats, and they came out last year, they're the most favoured team in the AFL when it comes to umpiring decisions. There were so many moments, though, Dennis, where I thought Carlton probably should have closed the door on West Coast. And I totally agree with you. I think 
you guys had the wind in your sails at that point of the year. I don't think you feared Geelong whatsoever uh, going into that prelim the next week. I think a lot of, I speak for a lot of Carlton fans, they still feel like that was potentially one of the years that got away from them. And if you'd gotten over West Coast away, imagine the confidence you would have taken into the prelim. It must, that one must be the one that really irks you. Yeah, look, it's a tough trip over there. Um, you know, as, as a Carlton player, we don't travel a hell of a lot, which is, you know, lucky. Um, but when you go over there for a final and, yeah, look, mate, I, I don't throw it down to one moment, but that moment does come up. And there's, like exactly like you said, there's a million more moments in a game of football that could determine a result, really. Um, but as a, as a blue bagger, mate, that was definitely clearly holding. It should be paid and it should be a goal. But, no, nah, it's... Uh, <laughs> It's um, like you said, we were we were playing some really exciting football, some really good finals brand football too, and um, we had a really good mix of of youth and experience and playing some really exciting football. And it was probably I still sit there in my personal reflection is the year that yeah we missed out on and is the what if year. Um, but you know we could have gone to the next week and got absolutely flogged or, or whatever. We don't know and um, we never will know. And, yeah, disappointing. Um, you know, that's what you play footy for, really. You know, finals football. It's a whole nother season. And, yeah, we let it slip again. But um, learning points, mate, and we, we go again and we, we're fortunate enough to have the next year. There you go. Next year's a funny one. Uh, 2013, obviously... The uh, Essendon saga means that Carlton managed to sneak their way into the finals. It's bizarre circumstances. Can you talk to us what it was like knowing that you finished ninth, but then, hey, you're going to play finals? It must have felt pretty weird. Oh, look, mate, it felt, ex- it felt excellent. And it was like, <laughs> hey, 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 Essendon are out and we're in, you know? So um, you never say no to playing finals. Um, so, uh, look, it was a weird year and obviously the whole saga and all of that, It's um, you never like to see that in the game, but um, good, bad or indifferent. Um, but, yeah, look, to play another final and, and to sort of technically make Richmond finish where they finished again, you know, is always a, a good result as well. And um, another game that I remember vividly, you know, walking out and Richmond fans banging their drums and it was, it was always good to sort of quieten those drums up. Definitely. It was a... It, it was a special game. I remember watching it, and to reference boxing, it was a bit of a rope a quite game where Richmond just threw everything at you in the first half, mm. and you just absorbed it, absorbed it, absorbed it, and then they just didn't show up after half time. Was there, was there a bit of coaching? Like, were you told they're probably going to come out of the blocks pretty hard, or is that just how it played out? Oh, look, they were they were up and about that year, and they were playing some really good, exciting football, and I think. Um, Oh, look, I don't know what it is, you know, but yeah, they came out and just went whack and and we sort of were taken sort of a step back a little bit, which, you know, can happen in football and, and football is a lot about momentum and it took us a little while to wrestle that momentum back, but then we sort of sort of stagnated their, their spurt a little bit and then we started to just chip away and that was always in our eyes just to just keep chipping away and probably also good that we had the Judd man on the side that could... Uh, put on a special show to, to get us back into that game as well. And, and that was what he was known to do. He uh, was a great leader by like, you know, no wonder he's got two short, short shoulders, mate. Um, he was like, hop on boys and let's get going. And um, he really led from the front there. And a lot of people really stepped up and we were fortunate enough to have a, yeah, what was one of, yeah, probably one of my most memorable wins, that's for sure. Yeah, that's what I was going to ask you because that was an absolutely incredible game. I remember being down at your favourite pub, Rob, the Cherry Tree Hotel, um, having a few beers, watching that one, and I just happened to have a few Richmond mates who just walked over from the G, very glum, very despondent after the game. They thought it was an absolute chew-in that they were going to roll Carlton. But was that the game for you, Dennis? Was that the most memorable game, memorable moment. Like that third quarter for me, that was a stuff of dreams when you blokes were running over the top of them. Is it is it number one for you? Yeah, it'd be probably one of the, the bigger wins I've had um, and one of the most memorable wins I've had. I'm, um, oh look, I'm not bringing into a con- concussion talk, but I've had a lot of head knocks, mate. And my memory ain't the greatest. And um, football can sometimes be a bit of a blur to me, but, you know, that game definitely is one I'd, 
do truly remember. And, um, you know, it helps also that in, in isolation, we were forced to watch a few games in uh, retro games and that was one of them. So I definitely recorded it, mate, just to make sure I could, you know, show people in the future that I did actually play for Carlton. So uh, <laughs> it's, uh, it's always exciting. But, um, yeah, look, it's definitely one that I, I remember, you know, like to, to not, really qualified then to get that chance and then to to make it count and um because that's again like i said you're, you're there to play finals you're there to it's a whole nother kettle of fish and you've seen over the last few years that you only have to be in it to win it and teams that from outside the four are starting to do that and um yeah we had that self-belief and yeah it was exciting to watch and um some great moments in that game that's for sure from both sort of both sides like you said yeah, it was an absolute ripper. One for the ages, that one for me. And, of course, given the circumstances, just another little jab there at Rob. Um, now, Matt Winley, who's uh, a former Herald Sun journalist and actually a, a good friend of uh, myself and Rob. Uh, we did a, a soccer podcast for a few years there and we used to constantly get this great man on. And he penned a very random piece, Dennis. Um, and I happened to find this one this morning when I was doing a little bit of research on you. Um, The piece in 2013 was about smartest players at a football club. Um, And the way that it kind of started out, it was like, okay, most footy players are blockheads. And I was like, geez, that's a nice little whack there from Matt Winley. Uh, But he went on to interview uh, a range of different people at every footy club. And he interviewed your assistant coach in 2013, Rob Wiley, uh, who spoke very highly of you, Dennis, because he put you in at number two. He said you're the second smartest bloke at the footy club behind Nick Duggan, and uh, Michael Jamison was just behind you in third. So I guess it begs the question, when you were playing at Carlton, uh, who wasn't the sharpest tool in the shed? Oh, look, mate, like I said, you keep your tricks up. But, um, no, look, um, there's a lot of smart men in it. There was a lot of smart men, obviously, in football. And um, I don't know about if I was second, to be honest, but I'll take it. I'm pretty (laughs) thick to be behind behind Nick, but that's okay. Um, but then, yeah, on the other spectrum, there's a lot of non-sharp tools, mate. Um, see ball, get ball type mentality. Um, Come on, who were they? I'm trying throw, to think. Um, throw them under the bus. I'm trying to think of who was uh, one of my good mates, Aaron Joseph. I'll, I'll throw him under the bus. Um, he just knew one thing, mate. Read the read the number on the opposition and just follow it around. That was what he was <laughs> he was good at. He was known for doing some great jobs on, uh, you know, Gary Ablett and the likes. But he was he was someone that was just um, he's a great character, a great lad, but um, ain't the sharpest tool in the shed, that's for sure. Um, who else? I'm trying to think of uh, who else struggled a little bit. There's there's a few, but yeah, you always remember, <laughs> you always remember doing the game plan, and um, people couldn't even put an X on the board sometimes. So uh, it happens, but you know, street smarts, footy smarts, and life smarts are all different things, mate. So I'm sure they've got their strengths in other areas. They are. They are indeed. Now, while we're speak, now we're, while we're potting blokes, there's one person in the AFL landscape who pots people more than anyone else, and his name's James Brayshaw. He sits up there in his ivory tower in the commentary box. You became one of his favourites over your career, and there's plenty of YouTube videos of James Brayshaw going absolutely berserk. Did you have many uh, chats with JB and started to wonder why he had this obsession about you? It was funny, mate. Um I didn't have any chats with him, but I obviously got a few segments on his radio and um, always interesting to have a chat. But I still remember to this day, um, there was the whole Dennis saga and the, the clip that came out. And I actually walked in, I was flying back, I think from Perth um, to Melbourne to get ready for pre-season, I think it was. And I remember he was up the front end of the plane, the pointy end, and I was walking towards the back and... Um, I remember walking past and saying good day, you know, and thinking, obviously, he celebrates my name and you sort of know who he was, but he had no idea who I was. <laughs> um, so, so for a bloke that um, was obsessed with my name and uh, shouting it out, I think um, he only knew me if I was in a in a car outfit. So I was tempted to get get up the back of the plane, get changed, and then maybe try again. But the, the uh, hostess put that little rope across, mate, and there's no getting past that rope. That's like a barrier there. Hey, hang on, I'm I'm confused because I actually don't listen to Triple M. I I don't really listen to the radio when I when I'm consuming footy content. Period. What the hell was he saying? Like, what was his thing? Why 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 was he so obsessed with you for someone that's actually not aware of this? Oh, if I'm honest, mate, it's probably who the hell has a 1960s name 
by the <laughs> Dennis in, in the year 2000. Um, that's probably one thing. And um, probably because I just had like a seedy moustache, a seedy beard, goatee thing. And, just, and you still do. And tattoos, yeah. So I think he was trying to give... Um, give the small man a little bit of limelight and um you know i'll, I'll definitely take it mate i'll definitely take it all uh, uh very proud to uh wear the dentist name mate and have that badge and um yeah it would have been nice if you could just give me a thumbs up on the plane but that's okay we, we live with it and he's a busy man and you know when you're up that end you probably don't lift your head very much so yeah no nah, fair enough i'm gonna have to go back and have a look rob because uh not really aware of this cult figure status from Triple M. Probably had something to do with the fact that throughout the majority of your career, uh, Melbourne was shit out. So I probably didn't take as much as a, as much of an interest as I do in footy at the moment, Dennis. But um, we'll move on. This is something I'm super, super proud of and something that obviously you as the recipient of this award would be chuffed with. But in 2015, you received the Jim Steins Community Leadership Award. Um, are you able to just speak to that? Because Jim Stein, for me, is someone that I, I hold in the... Hang on, I'll just show you. I hold in the highest of regard. I got my little Jim Stein's sticker here. Um, and he's, for Melbourne supporters, he's an absolute icon of the game, uh, considering all the work he did with the Reach Foundation and a champion footballer on the field, of course, a Brownlow medalist. Um, tell us why you received the, the award uh, in 2015 and, and what it means to you. Yeah, look, mate... Um you know, just the legacy that Jim Stein's left behind in not only Melbourne's football community, but every football community. And I think um, to see what he did both on and off the field from a bloke that, you know, all the way from Ireland to do what he did in our game is is surreal. And 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 to do what he did in our in our community as well is surreal. And um, I um, I was sort of one that when, when you made footy, it was always a pretty lucky people wanted to actually welcome you and, and have you in and um, yeah, allow you to, to give back. And I went out to Odyssey House, which is a drug and alcohol um, rehab house. And um, I did a tour with the, the, the host there in residence and um, just fell in love. I was sort of big on breaking stigmas down and big on um, trying to just be there for people and being here. And so I started to, I became an ambassador and did some work there and I'd go out once a week, sometimes twice, and just, just talk to the residents, be around there after training from about five o'clock till about nine o'clock at night. And um, yeah, just got to know some great people. And um, through that work, you know, you don't do it for any recognition or any accolades or anything. It was, um, it was something that I got a lot out of as well and learned so much in, in my time in doing that. And um yeah, I was fortunate enough to get nominated for the Jim Steins Award for the for your leadership in the community. And um, I remember I got the call up a week before the Brownlow and they said, oh, you've got to come to the Brownlow. Can you make it? And I'm like, oh, yeah, sweet. And I was fine. I had a black suit. You know, it's pretty easy. And the wife was, uh, what am I going to do, freaking out? And so that, that stress wasn't great. But we got there and um, I remember going, I'm so out of, I'm not meant to be here. What am I doing here? Like, I'm not a Brownlow man. Like, Oh, that's not me um, sitting on my table. And, you know, to be honest with you, mate, I was like, I'm just making up the numbers here. They had two empty seats and they just thought, yeah, that we'll get him to come along. And um, when, when my name got called out, mate, like as I was walking up, I was about to burst out into tears and um, Eddie Betts just puts his little fist out and goes, that's the way buzz. And I, uh, that just sort of refocused me and made me realize, and, you know, to win that award is, is something that, you know, it's actually on the wall just behind me here. Um, is something that I'm I'm super proud of. It's it's you know not that you do it for the awards. You know, it's it's great recognition for Odyssey House, and that's what probably made made me the the proudest. Is you know they're doing such great work, and, and it's probably something that isn't talked about in community as much, and isn't as um, as rosy to talk about. And to get that recognition for Odyssey House was something that I was very proud of, and to be a part of that and still continue to do my work where I can with Odyssey House. Obviously things have changed, but um, yeah, I think there's a million of great athletes and footballers and um, the like that do a super amount of work in the community. And I think, you know, I think a lot of them need recognition too. So yeah, very chuffed, mate. Very honoured. Um, to, to yeah, no, amazing work, mate. 
Yeah, very fantastic work. Now, I was chatting to a Carlton friend this morning and I said, I'm speaking to Dennis Armfield today. What's a game What's a game that you want me to bring up? Round 16, 2016 against Adelaide. You kick four goals in the first time. You were absolutely nailing them, slowing them from outside 50. Talk to me. What was going on? Was there like something special in the water that day? What happened? I probably got a, uh, a non-PG version. So two weeks, two weeks. Two weeks before I ruptured my testicle against St Kilda, um, and it was pretty bad, mate. It was, um, yeah, something that I wouldn't wish upon my worst enemy, if I'm honest. Um, had me surgery and all of that, and it was my first game back from, yeah, the ruptured nut. And um, I don't know what it was. Maybe it gave me some extra power or something. But I actually had to play that game with a a box. So I had a box in, and a specially made sort of box that sort of wrapped around a little bit if to go into detail really uncomfortable um but it must have just i don't know stretched a few muscles out a little bit more and allowed me to gain a 10 probably 15 extra meters on my kick mate so um yeah so i was fortunate enough to just be on the end of some good things in the first sort of half and then i think the second half mate i went completely missing so i'm glad i'm glad people only judge me by the first half i just wanted to talk about carlton Holistically, Carlton for me is a as a kid growing up, uh, the big dog really, the the most famous club in the land. Um, I, I, I'm not going to say I vividly remember 1995, the club's last premiership, but I certainly do remember it, watching it in the living room with the old man. Um, now I even said this to Rob just before we got you on. I kind of undervalued how competitive Carlton were during your career, um, and had moments of I guess, fleeting success. And certainly that semi-final against West Coast in that year is one that you put down as, ah, you know, that's an if year if they get to the prelim. But Carlton is such a big name, such a passionate club. You even see when the supporters and the the team gets on a roll and the supporters get behind the club. Um, And particularly under David Teague when he started to to get some momentum and some wind in their sails. It's super. The the one big thing about Carlton though is it's super disappointing how they've gone from I guess this behemoth famous club, which they they most certainly still are, sixteen premierships with Essendon, but just haven't been able to take that next step, Dennis, and been able to break that that drought and get back into real you know proper flag contention. So, like, do you think they're on the right path? Like, what knowing that you're still a a Carlton man and no doubt you'd still watch their games with great interest and talk to some of the people down at the club. Can you give the Carlton fans a bit of hope? Do you think they're finally back on the right path under Patrick Cripps and, and some of those boys? Yeah, look, um, you're probably right with the, you know, the, the juggernaut that Carlton is and, you know, probably lost our way a little bit. Um, obviously before I got there, there was some controversy around money and draft picks and all of those things that, um, get spoken about and you sort of look at that and go, well, I'm a big believer that whoever's at the club will get the job done. And, um, doesn't really matter whether you pick 46 or pick one, you know, you're still there to work hard. And, um, yeah, we were sort of the sort of so close and almost sort of for a while. Um, and then, you know, we sort of went down this youth and rebuild and, you know, I don't like to use that word because again, I believe that whoever gets picked should get the job done. And, um, yeah, we sort of um, started to implement some things, but, you know, some teams came on really, really well and some teams really leapt up and the competition took a whole new stance and um, we were sort of just left there a little bit. Um, but I think what they're doing now is, you know, and you can sort of see, like, even with the round one in front of an empty, you know, stadium and that, they were very competitive against Richmond and, and right in it, you know, for a team that probably got, blown away at the start to then come back and fight their way back to it. Um, you know, I think we've got some great leaders, some great youth coming on as well. And um, I think the the natural Carlton weighs back a little bit. And I think Tiggy and he's pretty open to say it is, you know, we've all got our strengths and on Saturday we've got to bring our strengths. And I think he's giving that license to players and, you know, you know, the old cliche Monday through to Friday work on your, you know, you work on your game, and but he's really big on your, on your strengths and, and playing off, you know, a lot of these kids, mate, and myself included, when you grew up, you just played off instinct. You just did what felt right. You didn't, you weren't so much worried about 
X marks a spot and, you know, you've got to go there. And I think Tegi coaches like that and you can see the players are really thriving off that. And I think, mate, we're, we're starting to build something and, and I'm really excited. I am um, going back to what you said, to be honest, when I retired, I didn't have anything to do with Carlton the year after because I sort of felt like a, a little hanger on her a little bit. And I sort of also wanted a break and a breather. And um, this year I was really looking forward to the year ahead. I was really back on the, the blues train and I was, um, yeah, um, the old Teague train, as they said. And, um, and I was, uh, I was tooting the horn, mate, but um, yeah, I think um, I'm really looking forward to see what they can build. And obviously, you know, every other team's doing the same thing. And, um, you know, every team in preseason is going to win the flag, you know, and, um, but I, I think you saw last year we were much more competitive and, and many games that we just lost. And, you know, obviously the ladder is one thing, but I think we're, uh, we're on the right path, that's for sure, and I'm excited. Now, from the Carlton juggernaut to the Juddenaut Chris Jard. Thank you for, the, oh. thank you for that, everybody. Um, Chris Judd, as you mentioned, came into the club same time that you did. Amazing player. We all know what he can do on the field. But talk to us a bit about what he was like off the field, behind closed doors, you know, within the four walls. Um, what was he like to everyone around him? Was it simply just, this is what I do, you should follow? Or did he actually give a lot of one-on-one time to people? Um, no, look, he was um, an absolute ripper. Um, he was probably someone that did come and change a little bit of the culture at Carlton. Um, he did say, we've got to work harder. We've got to worry about the little things and all the details. And, and he did, you know, let's be honest, mate. I remember getting there as a 20 year old and you sort of sit there and go, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to follow someone. I'm going to follow this bloke. And he, and he knew that. So he had a lot of pressure um, on him from, from us, I guess. Um, but off the field, mate, he had so much time for people. He would um, give everyone the time of day, whether you were a first, year or two a experienced player um one of the funniest blokes you could ever meet which is really weird um from the outside looking in you probably think he's a bit of a stiff but um you know he's he gets up does raps sings songs he's um, a massive what? comedian he's um yeah, he's, he's one of the uh one of the most uh, alternative blokes off the field that you can meet but um yeah he's but then he sort of he was someone that really got to know his teammates and um, where to to tread and where to what to say and where to where to go and um, that's why he was the leader of our football club and um, and not only that he led by example on the field so no, he was a ripper mate I don't have many bad words to say about him really yeah and he had a tour of Melbourne's facilities and uh, he thought nah this is uh, not for me and he and he moved over to Carlton um, I want to talk about a man uh, that is synonymous with a bit of fun, Brendan Vavola. Now, you only caught, I think, the last two or three years of his career at Carlton Dennis. But um, he's, he's a very funny man. He's an entertainer, a wonderful footballer. I think I brought it up a couple of weeks back on a podcast that he's one of my all-time favourites to watch live. Um, and I had the pleasure of even watching him while he's playing for Yarrawonga, which is where my family lives. And... Um, He was mercurial. He was absolutely something else, Fev. Uh, And I think the thing that I find, I don't know, funny or a little bit comical about him is he gave off this impression that he probably didn't work as hard as maybe some of the other players did. And I could be completely wrong here. Um, And he gave off this impression that he'd just rock up, like the Dennis Rodman of the AFL. He'd just kind of waltz in, do his thing, bin them from the boundary line, bin them from 60, and then he'd rock up and play. Was there a little bit of a sense of that? Was he laid back um, and maybe didn't push himself as hard as everyone, but as soon as he got to game day, um, he just you know switched on and the talent kicked in? Um, definitely. He trained a little bit different than the rest of us. Um, he was more of an explosive athlete and that was the way he trained. He did a lot of speed work, not a lot of endurance work. And um, you know, I still remember watching him do the 3.2K and he stopped and got a drink halfway. So, um, you know, like he was one of those characters, mate. Um, but... Again, exactly like you said, it was it was almost just getting in Fev's era and you knew something was going to happen and he was super on a football field, super off a football field. He was um, one of the larrikins, again, um, someone that probably um, got too much in court. He just wanted people to have fun. He wanted people to enjoy themselves and he probably just didn't realise that he was the most famous one out of the crowd of Carlton's players and 
he was trying to entertain us and unfortunately everyone else knew who he was and no one knew who I was. Um, so he was at the end of the receiving end, you know, and, um, but one of the most kind hearted blokes you'll meet um, still to this day, we, we have every regular sort of chat and um, someone that, yeah, would uh, do anything for his teammates and do anything for his mates. And um, I think, yeah, he was, he was a larrikin. He was a lad. Um, and it's, it's great to see what he's doing now in his life. And um, yeah, just sometimes he just didn't know where to draw the line, but sometimes we all do that. That's right. No, he was a larrikin. I remember one night, I think I'd just turned 18 and I had plenty of Dutch courage. I'd had a few beers at Arcadia on Turak and Punt Road. And I was walking out with a few mates walking 10 feet tall as you do when you're a teenager and you've had a gut full of beer. And I'm walking down the street and there was Brendan Vivola with a few of the Carlton boys and he's walking up the street. And I was like, I'm going to try my luck here. And I looked at the fixture and I was certain that Carlton were playing the next day. And I think Fev was having a few cheeky beers back then. Now, it wasn't the worst thing in the world. Of course, things have changed dramatically and probably changed around the time that you first got into the system, Dennis, where... Blokes are probably allowed to go out and have a beer or two, maybe before midnight in at home, then play the next day. And I'll never forget, I looked at the fixture and I went, he's playing tomorrow, why is he out? And I was like, okay, I'm going to be the little rat that calls him out across the street. And I said, oi, Fev, you've got a game tomorrow, mate. What are you doing? You're not disciplined. And he just looked at me. He paused for about five seconds, looked me up and down, and he just goes, shut up, stretch. And, tore, and it tore shreds off me because I've got my mates with me thinking I'm King Kong. And then they just looked at me and they were all laughing and taking the piss out of me. Fev and his mates are t- taking the piss out of me. And I walked off tail between my legs and I thought, that's Brendan Favola, ladies and gentlemen. What did he do the next day? I think he kicked six or seven goals and won the game for Carlton. So, um, yeah, talented man, Dennis. He's a super talent, mate. He only let me down once, and that was against Hawthorne when he should have kicked that goal. It would have made me career, I reckon. That oh, it would have been on the highlight reel for the years to come. But um, yeah, anyway, he's uh, yeah, he, he, like I said, he it was just get it in his area, and you knew something was going to happen. And I, I still, still to this day, wish he got the hundred. I'm still not happy with Hawthorne in that, but um, but um, like I said, to to do what he did for so long, and you know, um, an absolute superstar, I reckon. Yeah, and it's good, good words. It's great that he's back on track as well because it, it's well documented. He's had a few problems in his life, but it's, it's great to see what he's doing on radio at the moment because he's, he's, he's an entertainer. He's good fun. Rob, yes, quiz time. It is time for the quiz. Now, I'm not sure Ooh. if you've been pre-warned about this, Dennis, but... No, nah, he's the second smartest bloke at the footy there club. There you go, second smartest bloke at the footy club. So, uh, since, oh. since lockdown... Oh, that that yeah. was that year. Just yeah, know that. Just that, just that year. <laughs> so, since lockdown, we've been playing quarantine quiz with all of our guests. So, 10 questions. Some are footy related, some are general knowledge. It's just a bit oh. of everything. So, this is the current <laughs> leaderboard, just so you know. He's nervous, Rob. Glenn Manton, Carlton Premiership Players... On top with six, Alan Tuvey five, Brad Saul four, Sandy Roberts four, Russell Robertson four, Kale Morton got three, and uh, the dope from Sydney Swans, Alex Johnson, got two. So you, you got to beat two. That's what you're trying to. Yeah, right. Okay. Do you so, have any like just really basic ones? Just give me two easy ones and yeah. just let, let me beat AJ for okay. sure. <laughs> okay. Question one Who is the all time goal scorer for Carlton? Oh. Stephen Curnan? Yeah. That is correct. Well done. Well done. Well done. On the board. Good start. All right, hang on. Let's give him a bonus point. If he gets within, let's say, five goals of the total, Rob, what do you reckon? Uh, yeah, if you get close, I'll give you, I might give you a point. How many goals okay. do you think he kicked? How many goals he kicked? Oh, I'm going to go like 768 or something like that. Oh, oh that is so close. It's 758. Oh. Oh, I almost want to give you a point, but I'm not. No, going to. no, 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 no. I wasn't within five. Yep. Stuff. Question two. Correct. Big Desert is located in which state or territory of Australia? Where is Same Big, Big, Big Desert? Big Desert or Desert? Desert, like a desert where there's sand and stuff. Yeah. Big de- not Big <laughs> Desert. Big Desert yeah. is located in which state or territory of Australia? I'm going to go... I'm going to go Queensland. That is incorrect. It's actually in Victoria. Who would have thought? It's in uh, yeah, yeah. Out, out in the west near the SA yeah. border. How big, big. Yeah, That's what probably, probably not very big. <laughs> yeah. Question three. 
Uh, tigers are native to which continent? Asia. That is correct. That is correct. Well done. Dude, it was quick. Yeah, that's an easy one. Question four. Uh, which year did Cadell Evans win the Tour de France? Ooh. 2000... Oh. 2008? No, it was a bit later. Uh, 2011. Oh, right over. Question five. Who is currently the tallest player in the AFL to have played at least one game? In uh, the current... AFL? Game, who's out there at the moment? Is it Sanderlands? No, it's Mason Cox. Oh, Wait, did Sanderlands retire at the end of last year? Yeah, he did. Oh, that's stiff. Question six. George, oh, sorry, <clears throat> George R. R. <laughs> Martin is the author famous for which book series? Mate, I'm not a reader of those books. <laughs> <laughs> George R. R. Martin. Look, I, no. I don't even know. I'm going to say something stupid that's going to make me look. I'm going to go on the bottom half of the Carlton list after this one. Um, George R. R. Martin. No, I'll go Twilight. Twilight, no, incorrect. Uh, the series is called A Song of Ice and Fire, but I would have also accepted Game of Thrones is what we uh, all know it for. So, yeah, Game of Thrones. Yeah. Question seven. I've got two. I've got AJ, yeah, so I'm yeah, happy. I'm, yeah. Question, you've, got to, you've got to surpass him, though, yeah, James. There's a few more to come. Question come seven. Please spell Satanta O'Halpin. <laughs> right, oh. Um S-E-T-A-N-T-A, Satanta. O, do I need the little apostrophe thing? That's fine. Yeah. No, that's it. Yeah. Oh, yep. H-A-I-L-P-I-N. That is correct. Well done. Oh. Well done. Well done. You beat AJ. There we go. Question eight. <laughs> Who, who is currently the Deputy Prime Minister of Australia? Oh, that, um, he's got that weird name. Um, <laughs> Albert, Albertine, Albert, 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 uh, Albert, that's, <laughs> that's the opposition leader. Oh, that's right, I was close enough. <laughs> <laughs> oh, he, he used to be the deputy back when it was late, yeah. but I was looking for yeah. Michael McCormick. Yeah, no Everyone's chance. favourite Michael McCormack. But don't worry, I'm not into my politics either. Thanks, I'll wait until i got kids, Dennis. Question Thanks. nine. Thanks. Question nine. Uh, what date of the year is St. Patrick's Day? 17th of March. That is correct. Ooh. Well done, well done. Whoa, he's, what is he now? He's, he's on level four. with Sully. He's on four. Roberts. Robertson. He's, he's level with company. Sandy, Russell and Brad. Final yeah. question. Question ten. How many goals did you kick in your AFL career? Oh, no idea. Come on. We'll give you within five again. It's in the, no, it's no, in no, the no. 70s. I want, oh. I want on the money. I want, I want on the, the money. It's in the 70s. I want correct oh. answers. Come on. There's a chance to go equal second with twos. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get it wrong, but I'm going to go... I'm going to go 70... <laughs> Seventy what? Four. Oh, it was seventy five. Oh. <laughs> no, I reckon one. I reckon one shave the post that I got given. So that's fair enough. Yeah, <laughs> big. <laughs> yeah we'll take it off. Maybe. <laughs> yeah, they'll call it back on review. Now the th- the thing is, Dennis. Normally, when I do this, I ask how many Brownlow medals people got, but you never got one, so I didn't. I didn't I feel like I should vote, do that. So, <laughs> yeah, I know. How did you not get? A, how do you not get a vote? You had a few blinding oh, no, games. No, but... no, no. Sure. Midfield. 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 Yeah. There you go. Well, look, you're in good company. Brad Saul, Sandy Roberts, of course, commentary legend, and, of course, the high flyer, Russell Robertson. So you're there in the middle, mate. You're in good company. You're not as smart as Glenn, but you're a lot better than AJ and Carl Morton. So. I can't believe Glenn got there. Anyone with a bolt, surely should have got that. <laughs> <laughs> what questions did you ask him there? I'll tell you. I'm not- I'm going to go back and watch those. Yeah, ones. we'll uh, we'll send you the link to that one. It's an interesting cl- chat with yeah. Old Glenn. He's a he's a funny man. He's a ripper. He's, he's a, a funny man, man Old Glenn. Man. Well, there you go. Beautiful work. Yeah. Uh, well done, Dennis. Um, disappointed that Rob didn't give you that last one. I reckon you're really stiff there. Should have been level with Toves, but that's all right, mate. We'll wrap it up there. But um, before we do, uh, how much are you missing footy at the moment, coaching at Park Orchards? And what's the state of play? Like, are we going to get suburban footy going again this season or is it looking a little bit unlikely? Yeah, look, mate, missing footy. I'm missing all sport, to be honest. Um, I miss I miss the local footy just for the, the banner and fun and um, and running around on a Saturday. I do enjoy that. I, um, I'm probably one 
weird person that likes to get bashed and likes to get flogged around a little bit on the footy field. So um, I do miss that. Um, I do miss getting um, bashed and crashing and, and running around with some good mates. And, you know, I, I won't put Scotty in there, but, you know, he's, he's all right. Um, but uh, miss all sport, miss everything. I'm looking forward to things starting AFL, obviously, with local footy. Um, we sort of got a license that we can start training May 31st, which is, you know, a bit of light at the end of the tunnel, mate. But there's so many things behind closed doors that have to weigh up. And, you know, you don't want to see clubs fail or close or anything like that. You want to see everyone come back ready to go. So still unsure, mate. Hopefully we can have some sort of season. Um, that's what we're here to do. and We're here to play footy. But, you know, the world's a much bigger place and there's bigger things to worry about. But hopefully sooner or later, mate, all the sport's back because I'll tell you what, I'm sick of watching reruns of Days of Our Lives and things like that. So, uh, <laughs> So uh, let's just see where we can get to. Ah, beautiful work, mate. Well, you've been a very good sport. You are a very, very honest footballer. Got the best out of yourself, as we said off the top. It's been great to learn about your career, learn about Chris Judd being a comedian, Fev, uh, you name it. It's been great. So really enjoyed it, Dennis. Thanks a lot. Nah, thanks for having me, guys. Really appreciate it. And, um, yeah, I'm still going to go back and watch that Glenn <laughs> one. That's for sure. <laughs> thanks, mate. Yeah, do it. We don't know how he got six either. Cheers, mate. See you, guys. <laughs>